Here on BBC One, a galaxy of over a hundred thousand million stars in the sky at night. Good evening. You may remember that some time ago we presented a program about the minor planets or asteroids. Strange little worlds, most of which keep strictly to that part of the solar system in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Now, since that program, there's been a very interesting development. In 1979, our leading minor planet hunter, Elena Helene, discovered the asteroid now numbered 4015. Hasn't it been given a name? Now, this was an Apollo asteroid, which means it can swing away from the main swarm and can come quite close to the Earth. When Mrs. Helene found it, it was within 25 million miles and had a period of just over two years. All right. But then its position was checked back and it was identified on plates taken at Palomar as long ago as 1949. But then it was classified as a comet, Comet wilson harrington 1949-3, and it had a tail. And there's one of the original plates taken in red light. Ignore that vertical stripe over to the right, that's the fault on the plate. But there's the trail of the object, and you can see the tail over to the left. Here's the same star field in blue light, and there again is the trail. Now, on a modern picture, there it is, uh, same star field again, no trail this time. And here is the latest picture of the asteroid. It's that little streak in the middle of the plate, and no trace of a tail of any kind. Now, this is very interesting. There's long been a theory that the so-called Apollo asteroids are simply dead comets that have lost all their volatiles. I've been suspicious about that theory, but now, frankly, I'm starting to have second thoughts. And certainly, this, uh, this asteroid is being very interesting indeed. And now for the latest news on the Galileo probe, which is on its way to Jupiter. As I'm sure you know, the main high-gain antenna has not deployed properly, and efforts to free it have so far been unsuccessful. But with a good deal of electronic tinkering, it is still hoped to rescue most of the mission. It was launched from Earth, in October 1989. It couldn't go straight to Jupiter, hadn't got the power, so it made a flyby of Venus in 1990, picking up speed. It then went on round the Sun and made a pass of the Earth in December 1990, picking up yet more speed, and then went out to the asteroid belt and photographed the asteroid Gaspar. And this is the new picture of Gaspar, which is a curious rocky body pitted with craterlets, the only really good picture of an asteroid we have so far got. Well, Galileo is still going on, it will make a very close pass of the Earth on the 8th of December this year, and then out again into the asteroid belt, and we hope obtain an image of another asteroid called Ida. And finally, on to its main target, Jupiter, in 1995. The orbiting section will go round Jupiter, and the entry probe will actually go into the clouds. Obviously, it won't last for long, but it should send back some fascinating information just before it's being finally destroyed. As I say, we hope to salvage most of the information for Galileo, and of course, I'll keep you posted. And now, on to my main topic this evening. The object we used to call the Andromeda Nebula, and we now call the Andromeda Galaxy, or the Andromeda Spiral. The key is Pegasus, which now is visible high up in the southern sky after sunset. In mythology, Pegasus was a flying horse used by the hero Bellerophon in quest of a particularly nasty fire-breathing monster called a chimera. Well, in the sky, Pegasus doesn't look a bit like a horse. The main stars make up a square, and there's a picture of the square of Pegasus, although, quite honestly, I think maps and even photographs tend to make the square look rather smaller and brighter than it really is. But you can see the main pattern is quite distinctive. The stars in the square are not alike. If you look at them one after the other with binoculars, you'll see that the upper right-hand star, which is called Scat, is not like the others. They are white, and Scat is orange, indicating a lower surface temperature. It's also slightly variable. But look now, please, at the upper left-hand star, which is called Alpha Rats. Magnitude 2, almost exactly the same in brightness as the pole star. You'll agree that it certainly belongs to the square of the Pegasus pattern. And yet, for some reason I can't explain, the controlling body of world astronomy, the International Astronomical Union, decided to take it away from Pegasus and give it a free transfer to the next constellation of Andromeda. So, Delta Pegasi, or Alpha became Alpha Andromedae, 
And there's a picture of Andromeda, as you can see, stretching away from Alpharetz. And look at the map. I think we'd agree that Alpharetz, joining the two, quite definitely does belong to the Pegasus pattern, but now we've got to call it Alpha Andromedae. Andromeda herself has a legend. In mythology, she was a beautiful princess who was chained to a rock to make a meal for a sea monster. Although I'm glad to say this particular legend did have a happy ending because she was rescued by the gallant hero Perseus at something rather later than the 11th hour. Andromeda is made up mainly of several second magnitude stars. Alpharetz is one, then there is Myrach, which is orange, and then there is Almach, or Gamma Andromedae, which is a rather lovely colored double star. Not separable with binoculars, but a small telescope will do so, and there's an orange-yellow primary and a blue companion. It really is a genuine binary star. But now, on to our main topic, the Andromeda spiral, the Andromeda galaxy. First of all, identify Marac. If you like, use binoculars. Check two much fainter stars, Mu and Nu Andromedae, and there, a faint smear of light, you will see M31, the Andromeda system. M stands for Messier, Charles Messier, who catalogued these things way back in 1781. Now, you can just see the Andromeda system on a clear night if it's really dark. Binoculars show it well, and in a small telescope, it looks like this. This is a picture taken by Commander Hatfield, and that gives a very good representation of what you'll see with powerful binoculars or a small telescope. Not very spectacular, but quite fascinating, and one of the most studied and most important objects in the entire sky. Obviously, it's been known for a long time. It was recorded by the ancient Arabs, the great Arab stargazer Al-Sufi droid, and there is the Andromeda system at the mouth of the fish. Frankly, I don't know where the fish came from. And then uh, a contemporary of Galileo's, Simon Marius, he saw it and described it as looking uh, like the light of a candle seen through a horn. And then along came Charles Messier and his famous catalogue. He described the system, M31, as shaped like a spindle. And there's Messier's actual drawing. And note also there are two other objects in the same field. To the upper right, a smaller system, which Messier labelled number 32, and below the main, uh, the main system, another system, which uh, he didn't letter, we call it NGC 205. NGC meaning New General Catalogue. Even by now, it's no means new. It's over 100 years old. And there's a modern picture showing all three, M31 in the middle, M32 upper right, and NGC 205 lower down. They're all of the same nature, but as you can see, only M31 is obviously a spiral. But what exactly were they? In Messier's catalogue, there were systems of all kinds, clusters, gaseous nebulae, such as the Sword of Orion, and you can't doubt that that's made up of gas. There were also starry nebulae, of which M31 was a very good example. So were they actually made up of stars, or were they simply made up of gas? They didn't show very much shape in the telescopes of Messier's time. They looked like patches in the sky. But then, in 1845, along came the third Earl of Ross with his giant 72-inch reflector built at Burr Castle in Ireland, much the most powerful ever made up to that time. And there's a painting of the third Earl going up to observe. With this giant telescope, he looked at the starry nebulae, and he found that some of them, by no means all, were spiral in shape, like huge Catherine wheels. And there are two of Lord Ross's drawings. Over on the right-hand side, Messier 51 in the hunting dogs, a lovely spiral known as the whirlpool, and a second spiral over to the left. So quite clearly, these were different from the gaseous nebulae. And it became apparent too that M31, the Andromeda system, was also a spiral, but is placed at a rather unfavorable angle to us. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have a model of a ga galaxy, and you're seeing it edge on. If we could see it face on, it would be seen in its spiral form. And M31 lies at a rather narrow angle, so the full beauty is lost. But frankly, I'm always very sorry that M31 isn't face-on. It would be so glorious if it were. But even though Lord Ross had shown that these things were spirals, and they consisted of stars, were they parts of our own galaxy, or were they something much more significant? At the end of the last century, the general opinion was that they were minor features of our own Milky Way galaxy. But some people dis disagreed. And the man who showed what the real truth was, was Edwin Hubble, the great American astronomer after whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named. He was able to do this by using what was then the most powerful telescope ever built, the Mount Wilson 100-inch reflector. And using that, he took magnificent pictures, and there's one of Hubble's own pictures of M31 with his two companions, M32 and NGC 205.
and in it you can see individual stars. But still, what was the distance? How could you find out? Well, Hubble had a very good way. He used fascinating stars known as Cepheid variables. Most stars, including our sun, luckily for us, shine steadily for year after year, century after century. But there are some which don't. They brighten and fade, brighten and fade. And some of these variable stars are known as Cepheids, after the first discovered member of the class, Delta Cephei. And they are absolutely regular in their behavior. They brighten and fade, brighten and fade, as regularly as clockwork, in periods ranging from a few days to a few weeks. It had been found that the period of a Cepheid is a key to its real luminosity. The longer the period, the brighter the Cepheid. I've got a demonstration here to show you what I mean. Here we have the two studio Cepheid variables. Obviously, we've made the period seconds, not days or weeks, but the principle is the same. Note that the star on the right is varying more slowly than the star on the left. And therefore, if these were genuine Cepheids, the right-hand star would be the more powerful of the two. And simply by watching how a Cepheid behaves, you can tell how luminous it really is. And since these stars are thousands of times brighter than our sun, they can be seen over vast distances. So Hubble looked for Cepheids in the starry nebulae, and he found them. He found some in M31. He measured their periods, deduced their distances, and saw straight away they were so far away they could not possibly be members of our own galaxy. And therefore, the starry nebulae had to be galaxies in their own right, thousands of light years away. He measured the distance of the Andromeda spiral as 900,000 light years, later reduced a bit. Anyway, it was well, well beyond our own particular galaxy. But even that wasn't the end. There were further developments in 1952 due to the work of Walter Bader. And he was using what was then the biggest telescope in the world, the Palomar 200-inch reflector, even more powerful than the Mount Wilson 100-inch. And he found that there had been a mistake in the Cepheid scale. There are two types of Cepheids, and one type is twice as luminous as the other. Hubble, through no fault of his own, had picked wrong. The Cepheids he'd measured were in fact twice as luminous as he believed, and therefore they had to be twice as far away. And instead of being within a million light years, the distance of the Andromeda spiral was 2.2 million light years. And the distances of all the other galaxies had to be increased proportionately. The universe was twice as big as anyone had believed. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, contains something like 100,000 million stars. The Andromeda system is more populous than that, something like 150,000 million stars, and it's even larger than our own system. It contains clusters, nebulae, color stars, exploding stars, and uh, even supernovae. Now, a supernova is a rather interesting thing. It marks the death of a very massive star, which, when it uses up all its nuclear energy, the core collapses, the inside falls in upon it, there's an implosion followed by an explosion, and the star literally blows itself to pieces in an incredibly violent outburst that can be seen over millions of light years. And that is a supernova, and all that's left at the end is a very small, super-dense core made up of neutrons. And you could pack a thousand million tons of neutron star material into an egg cup. Now, supernovae are not very common. In our own galaxy, None has been seen since the year 1604. But in 1987, we did see one in the large cloud of Magellan, which is one of the nearest of the outer galaxies, only 169,000 light years away, much closer than M31. And there's a picture of the supernova at its best. It's that bright thing near the middle of the picture, and there's nebulosity up to the upper left. Well, there hasn't been a naked eye supernova since 1604. <laughs> Don't anyone get another one. And frankly, I couldn't resist going down to South Africa to have a look at it. You couldn't see it from here. It was too far south in the sky. So I did that, and I can't resist showing you my picture, taken with a handheld camera. There's the large cloud, the little patch in the middle, uh, and the supernova close by it. It's faded now, but it's set astronomers problem after problem. We've done several programs about it, and the story is by no means over yet. Now, in 1885, there was a supernova in the Andromeda galaxy. Rather interesting discovery. One of the independent discoverers was a Hungarian baroness named Pogmanixi. He was giving a star party on her lawn in her castle, had a hand telescope there, and uh, was showing her guests the various stars, looked at the Andromeda galaxy, and saw that there was a star there which shouldn't have been there. And there's a representation of it 
We call it S. Andromedae, but it's sadly, of course, there's no photograph of it. I must say, the Baroness didn't really recognise it for what it was, and she wasn't even the first. Nevertheless, it's an interesting story, and I'm quite sure that S. Andromedae is the only supernova ever to have been discovered by a Hungarian Baroness. It's long since faded, of course, but we have detected its remnant, and it really was a genuine supernova. When there's going to be another one there, I do not know. Now, as I've said, uh, M31 has got two companions, M32 and NGC 205. And look at NGC 205, the circular one below the Great Spiral. Uh, it really is slightly elliptical, uh, no spiral structure there. But look at M32 to the upper right. A lovely picture of that has just been sent back by the Hubble Space Telescope. And there's a picture of the nucleus of M32. And that demonstrates again, I think, that although the Hubble Telescope does have a faulty mirror and can't do some of the things it ought to have done, in many ways, it can still outperform any Earth-based telescope. Another interesting discovery about these starry nebulae, or galaxies, was that they appear to be racing away from us, or rather most of them do. We measure this by means of what's called the Doppler effect. If a source of light is moving away, uh, fewer light waves per second will reach your eye than would be the case if the object was standing still, and the light appears slightly reddened. The actual color change can't be noticed, but the spectrum of a star or a galaxy is crossed by dark lines, and if those dark lines are displaced toward the red or long wave end, it means that the object is receding. And the further away it is, the faster it's going. And almost all the galaxies show these red shifts, indicating that the entire universe was expanding. But not M31. That was one of the few which was not moving away from us, and we now know that is because it's part of a stable association of galaxies known as the local group, made up of our own Milky Way system, the two clouds of Magellan, the large cloud and the small cloud, the smaller spiral in the constellation of Triangulum, the triangle, and over two dozen dwarf systems. And they are not receding from us. In fact, M31 is actually approaching at the moment Although I can assure you, that won't go on indefinitely, and there's no fear of a collision on the line. And we believe also that our local group is part of a larger association known as the supercluster, centered upon the group of galaxies in the constellation of Virgo, more than 50 million light years away. So our own galaxy is only one of very many, and the Andromeda galaxy is another. So let's transfer ourselves in imagination to a planet in the Andromeda system, and have a look at the sky from there. There in the foreground, we see the main mass of M31. And then, right in the distance, our own galaxy, more than two million light years away, looking like a small smear of light in the Andromedan sky. Meanwhile, we on Earth can always go and find the Andromeda galaxy. So, um, if it's clear tonight, do go and have a look. Go out, identify the square of Pegasus, the chain of stars marking Andromeda, find Mayalak, new and new, and then have a look at the Andromeda galaxy. It may appear unspectacular, but remember, it's a huge system, larger than ours, and in fact, it is the most remote object ever visible clearly with the naked eye. And when you see it, you're looking back more than two million years. When I come back next month, I'm going to stay much nearer home. There's been some fascinating research in connection with the planet Venus, and I'm going to tell you about that. Meanwhile, if you want the latest astronomical information, all you have to do is to dial our information line 0898 000. Or, of course, dial CFAX, page 626. And so, until next month, good night.